guys, welcome back to Revive School. I'm Wesley, part of the Revive Texas team. This is lesson number seven, and uh, I hope you've been enjoying Romans. Uh, I've actually had a blast reading through it myself. It's always good to go back. I actually think Romans is one of the most pivotal books that you see in the New Testament as far as, man, just really digging into who you are in Christ, and man, how that should propel you, and then how it affects the people around us, whether it be Jew, Gentile. And so I hope you guys are just really plugging through this, and man, even go back sometimes if you're not really processing Sometimes I read so much, I don't really understand it. And so just take it in bite-sized pieces and start processing with the Lord what it is. And so I get the luxury today of jumping in Romans 7. Uh, I remember when I was in Bible college, uh, man, I was, it's been a while, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, I had the luxury of writing a paper on Romans 7, this flesh-spirit conflict. And there's so many different ideas on this. Not really that many, but different camps. But I kind of just want to speak from experience and then just look at the Scripture and see what we can glean from uh, from Romans 7, because what you've been seeing is, man, salvation only comes through faith. Uh, we all have sin problem, Romans 3. We're all dead in our trespasses and sin. Uh, then you progress through that there's the wage of sin is death, there's a consequence. But we can be justified by faith and have peace with God through Romans 5. But what about this process of living free from sin? What about now, now that I am justified, now that I am, I've reckoned myself, like Sean taught you, dead to sin but alive in Christ. How does that practically work out before me? Because there's several different camps on this Romans 7 where you see Paul saying in the end, I'm just going to go there for a minute because I want to debrief you and then we're going to jump in the Word. Where when you get out in Romans 7, it, in Romans 7, 1, it says, Do you not know, brethren, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? Well, we're going to dive into this to see if, we, that, if sin and law still has dominion over us. Or is it something more that we're making a choice? Is this whole flesh-spirit conflict, is this an external conflict or is it an internal some texts say, I'm not real big on this sinful nature, to be honest with you. I think NIV says sinful nature. If that's your camp, stay in it. But my heart is, I believe it's a body's flesh spirit. I believe when Jesus died on the cross for our sin, he set me free. John 8 says, we're going to go there. He set me free from sin. Not now, Kevin, sorry. But in that, man, I want you to process this because Paul says some things. Man, I want to do some things, but I can't do it. What I want to do good, I do bad. And there's this crazy dynamic here that if you're not careful, you can get caught up in. Here's, my, here's the dilemma. If I still have a sinful nature, or whatever you want to call it, then I still sin. But then I really can make an excuse that, oh, that's just my sinful nature. You know, I'm just going to be angry the rest of my life. No. Nope. The Bible says you're dead to sin. And so when we jump into Romans 7, man, I'm going to poke you a little bit, and you can poke me back. <laughs> Not really, because I can't hear from you. But the reality of it is, I want to dive into this and ask some questions. My heart is this. we got to live free from sin. There is no excuse for sin. We can live free from sin. I don't lay this, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not sinning. When I wake up, I'm not sinning. Now, when my four kids jump into my life, sometimes I start, uh, sin becomes prevalent. But I don't think that, here's, here's where I'm going. Uh, this is the story I use. Uh, Kevin, how do you know a dog's a dog? Maybe a little quicker. How do you know the difference between a dog and a cat if you couldn't see them? If you couldn't see them but from the sound of them. Yeah, what does a cat do? Meows. Yep. What's a dog do? Barks. Yeah, have you ever seen a dog meow? Nope. Neither have I. You know why? Because it's nature's to bark. I've been doing a lot of gospel presentations in my neighborhood, just hanging them on doors, and man, dogs are not my friend. They'll knock the door down barking at me. I've never seen a cat knock the door down barking at me. No, a cat's nature's what? It rubs on the side of your leg. I want you to pet him. It meows. And so here's where I'm going with this, man. You're, when I was in Christ, before I knew Jesus, I acted a certain way. I lived a certain way. I spoke a different language. There was all these different things I did. And I just did it. It's who I was. It was my nature. When I met Jesus, something shifted in my life. The Holy Spirit entered my heart, and I've never been the same. Now, it took a process for me to kind of cure it, but the minute I gave my life to Jesus, something shifted. And from then on, I couldn't go back to barking, per se, because I, this, yeah, this love started hitting my heart. And so I have a hard time with this sinful nature just because, man, the Bible says you've been set free. Anyone, you're dead. And so as we start processing, I want you, I want to just kind of pick your brain as we start going through this, Romans 7. Because I believe God set us free from sin to live for Him free from sin. Uh, do we sin? We still sin. That doesn't mean I make an excuse for it. No, it means what I partnered with it. And uh, therefore, I came under the law of it. And so let's jump in. Enough of me. Let's see what the Word of God says. So like we read in Romans 7, it says, As long as man lives, law has dominion over him. And then if you look at verse 2, he gives us a picture. Sometimes we've actually used this as a marriage principle more than what he's trying to teach this principle of the law versus grace. And so in verse 2 he says this, For a woman who has a husband, all right, they're married. You can't have a husband if you're not married. Is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. 
But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So very simple. All this is saying is, we know this, uh, for the woman has a husband, she's bound by law because what? She made covenant. God, to sickness, death, death do us part. I don't want to go through the whole marriage ceremony, but this is what it is. You make covenant with God, you come under law to what? Be married. And then it says as long as what? As long as he lives. When he dies, you're off the hook. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it says you are off the hook, right? You're no longer under that covenant when he dies. But if the husband dies, she's released. That's what he's saying. She's released from that covenant of her husband. She can go be remarried. Verse 3. So if then, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called what? An adulteress. Why? Because you can't have two. You'd be adulterous with one. But if her husband dies, she's what? Free from that law. Significant here about law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she has married another man. Verse 4. Therefore, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. Hold on a minute. He's not talking about, maybe he is talking about marriage, but maybe he's not. What's he saying here? He says, therefore what? You've become dead. Dead to what? To that covenant that was holding you down. You've been dead to the covenant of law through who? Through the body of Jesus Christ. So what happened to the body of Jesus Christ? He died and he rose again. Therefore, you may be married to another. Well, who are you going to marry? I'm glad you asked. Uh, tell your wife you're married to Jesus now and her. Amen. To him who was raised from the dead that we would bear fruit to God. So when Christ died, he rose again. And now in that, by faith, when we give our life to Jesus, we step into covenant with God through Jesus. And this text says that we're actually married, married to him who was raised from the dead. Jesus, why is this? So we should bear much fruit. So that we would bear fruit unto God. What fruit is that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And so our heart is that as we step into this covenant, you're supposed to bear fruit, not fruit of sin, death, sickness, this business. So look at verse 7 and 5, Kevin. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Verse 6. But now, but now what? Now that we've died, but now that we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of letters. So look at the transition in 6. Now that we've been delivered, delivered from what? The law. How did you get delivered from the law? You had to die. Remember the marriage covenant. Until the husband died, you weren't set free. Well, when we came to Christ, what? We were dead. And the Bible, it talks about many times in the Bible, reckon yourself dead to sin, alive to Christ. We've crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. There's much language in how we're going to live this sanctified Christian life is there has to be a death and it's a continual death. But in that it says we've been delivered in death by, from the law, having died to what we were held by. Remember 7-1 said it had dominion over. We were held by the law. Before I met Jesus, I was a hot mess. I, could tr I had behavior modification. I'd try not to be angry until you made me angry or until you really ramped it up and then I'd lose my mind. I'd get so angry. Why? Because I was in dominion. But this says what? Now that we have died, to what we were held by, so that we what? We can serve now. That Sean talked about being a slave of righteousness. You were a slave under the law to death. Now you're a slave unto God to righteousness. See the transition here? Now in that process, you're serving what? In the newness of the Spirit. Guess what? You didn't have Holy Spirit before you met Jesus. Somebody, Sean's going to talk about that tomorrow in Romans 8. No, now that you're in Christ, you have Holy Spirit. And now you can step in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the law. Because if you process law and grace, it's this flesh-spirit conflict. The law was what? You tried to keep it. The spirit is you just walked by faith and you walked in love. And then in that, you fulfilled the letter of the law. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is law sin? So a rhetorical question comes up when Paul's talking to the Romans. Well, well, what do we say? The law came from God. Well, if the law came from God, well, then is the law sin? Was God wicked and sinful when He gave us the law? Was, was it a bad thing that He gave us the law? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. The scripture says that the law was a schoolmaster. Well, I don't know how many of you had schoolmasters, but every one of you had some kind of schoolmaster. The law was a schoolmaster. It led me to realize I couldn't do it. I couldn't make it. That God is holy. He is just. He is pure. And in that, I've fallen short of the glory of God. But it's not a wicked thing. No, it's like guardrails are meant to keep me off the cliff. So when the law came in my life, it's supposed to point me to Jesus, His holiness and His righteousness. For the Messiah to come, the Savior of the world, the justifier, like we've been talking to in Romans, that justice is in the law. It's God's nature. 
It's not wicked. What's wicked is me that I'm disobedient and I've fallen short of that in my sinful condition. But this is what he said, I wouldn't have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. Now some of you are like, well, that's weird. I don't want to go into this great detail because I don't completely understand it. But before the law came through Abraham, Adam sinned in the garden. There wasn't a sin there that said, hey, don't covet. There wasn't a sin there that said, don't, like Sean said, run 70. If you're running down a highway and there ain't no speed limit, you can't break the speed limit. But the minute they put 70 on there, you just broke the speed limit. But the reality of it is we still transgressed God's law and sinned and disobeyed Him without the law. But where the law was, there was a trespass. Verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all kinds of evil desire. It's kind of crazy how people just really disobey the law. For apart from the law, the sin was dead. Verse 9. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Keep going, Kevin. I'm going to cruise through here. Uh, I think I'm going to go to verse 12. And the commandment which was to bring life, I actually found it to bring death. What was meant to bring life in my life actually produced death in me because in that I realized I couldn't attain to what the law said. Verse 11, for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me. Sin deceived me by the commandment and it killed me. I got under the law. Verse 12, therefore the law is holy. Ain't nothing wrong with the law. Ain't nothing wrong with God. The commandment's holy and it's just and it's good. I want to pause here for a minute because you can kind of get hung up in the text here. So what you see here is Paul talks about this marriage covenant. He talks about how we've now died to the law and been set free and living married to Christ. And in that now he kind of goes on this exposition about, well, is the law sinful? No, it's not that we go out and break the law. Remember what uh, Sean taught you in Romans 6. Shall we continue to sin? No, God forbid. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. Certainly not. Uh, Romans 6 says, reckon yourself dead to sin, but what? Alive in Christ Jesus. And so I want to pause here for a minute and talk about this law thing. Because what, what's he really saying in all this? And so if you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul is actually, the context of this is Peter and Paul are uh, hanging out. I think it may be Jerusalem Council. I can't remember where they're at, but they're around Jewish people. And Peter kind of gets a little weary of hanging around Paul because he's known to hang around with Gentiles. So he starts hanging out with the elite Jews. And Paul sees it like, hold on a minute, you're acting different around them than you were with these guys. You're kind of being double-faced. You're kind of being two-sided. And he confronts Paul. He calls him out. And then in Galatians 2.15, it's kind of the context of this. He kind of gigs all of them. He says, uh, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. We've been talking about through Romans, right? Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith, that's Romans 5, not by the works of the law, but by the works of the law, what? No flesh shall be justified, verse 17. But if we, us people, Jewish people, if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Verse 18, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I want to stop right here just a second. What's he talking about building? Here's the conflict I see in our lives. We give our life to Jesus. We're justified by faith. We can't do it. It's not of works. You can't work for it. You, you can't. You receive it and he makes you righteous. But what happens is the next day, you, if you're not careful, you'll go back under the law. You'll actually start trying to perform. You'll actually start trying to stop being angry in your own flesh. You'll actually try to clean up your language in your own flesh. And the reality of it is God never designed it that way because what you're doing is you're going back under the law instead of the Spirit. The Spirit of Christ came to set you free in Galatians 5. We're going to go there in a little while, not now. It says walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill desires of the flesh. You've got a choice to make. I totally believe that as you walk this thing out, if you're not careful, you'll build again the things that's actually bringing death to you. You'll get back under trying to do right and be right and act right instead of just doing what's inside of you. I don't have to act right. I am right. I have to choose. I have to make a choice not to partner with things I believe external from me. It's a mindset shift. I can go back under the law. Uh, Kevin, real quick, if you want to go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, I think this one says it, it says it the same way, but a little different. Paul says to the Galatian church, Stand fast, therefore, in what? Liberty. That's freedom. You've been free. He set you free. Free from what? Sin and death. He set you free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by Christ has made you free. And watch this. Don't be entangled again. Uh-oh. What's that? 
I think about rope, you know, or vines, you run through a kudzu patch and you're getting tangled up and you're falling. Don't be entangled again. Again means there was a time in your life when you were entangled. They cut the ropes. They cut the things off your leg. Now you're free. They set you free. They broke the chains. But he says, be careful. You don't go back and entangle yourself again with a yoke of bondage. I believe in this context, the people that we're talking about here, the yoke of bondage is the law. Don't entangle yourself back with circumcision. Don't back entangle yourself with trying to keep the works of law. Why? He set you free. Now you've got to learn to live free in Him. John 15 says, Abide in me and I'll abide in you. Apart from me you can do nothing. I'm the vine, you're the branch. You can't bear fruit apart from me. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now watch what he says, For without me you can do nothing. So when Christ sets us free, He's given us Holy Spirit. And in that, we're supposed to abide in that for righteousness sake. But if you're not careful, you'll fall up under the do's and the don'ts of the legalism and the law. And what happens is it'll produce death in your life again. Me personally, I don't think it means you have a sinful nature. No, it just means you chose to partner with something external to you. And in that, what happens? You fell back under the death because you can't keep the law. If you could, Jesus didn't have to come. So as you start processing Romans 7 about this whole flesh spirit, this marriage, it's what? It's making sure that when I'm walking myself out in faith, we're going to go there in a minute, that I'm walking and I'm abiding in what Jesus says. And in that, I just produce it. It's like a dog, man. When I walk up to them doors of them people's houses, they just bark. Nobody has to tell them. It's in their nature. They just react. That's how they react. And what I've seen in my own life, when I'm abiding in Jesus, I react. And how do I react? With Jesus. So, Kevin, if you'll go back to Galatians 2.18, and here's what it says now. We just talked about it. says, For if we build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, here's the bridge with 19. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. See the deal? That, that whole part about rebuilding is talking about the law. Verse 20. And this is what Paul says. For I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. There's a couple key pieces in this. We all know this, but we practically study it. I've been what? Crucified. Crucified what? To sin, death, and the law. I'm dead. Dead to sin. Alive to Christ. It's no longer what? I who live. That's weird. No, it's Jesus living through me. I'm getting out of the way, letting Him live. And the life I now live in the flesh, some people say sinful nature. I say flesh. I've got the mind of Christ. My old body still remembers some crazy things, but guess what? I discipline my body, submit its will to God. It's, I discipline myself. Paul said, I don't beat at the air. No, I discipline myself so that I can run the race and not be qualified. The life I now live in the flesh, how does he live it? By faith. By faith. You walk out in faith and when, what you believe, you start to manifest. I am righteous. Boom. I am a child of God. I am an ambassador. I am a, a saint. I am a royal priesthood. You walk this thing out by faith. I'm going to love you no matter what. Why? Because Jesus said to, and I believe it. I believe the Holy Spirit's in me. I believe when I die, He lives. You walk this thing out by faith who loved me and gave Himself for me. And so, Kevin, if you want to go back to Romans 7, I hope this is kind of making sense with you. I really believe with all my heart, sometimes, whether you're at an either camp, you can, this argument of, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, man, that's who I was when I got saved. That's not who I am now. I'm a sinner that used to sin. Now I've been saved by grace and I'm learned to be sinless. Sin what? I'm sinning less and less and less and less and less each day. I'm learning to take captive every idle thought. I'm learning that this external sin thing that's around me, I can actually, I've got dominion over it. But what I've got to do is reckon myself dead to sin, alive to Christ, and learn to how to discipline my body. And so let's jump in where Paul was saying, Kevin, in Romans 7. I think I'm in chapter, verse 13. So Paul says this, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it may appear sin, was producing death in me through what was good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. He's talking about good to me was the law. The death was that he was sinning under the law. It wasn't that the law was bad, it's that he just didn't add up. He couldn't do it. Verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold unto sin. The law is spiritual, it's from God. Uh, but Paul said, I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. Remember, the slave to sin. Verse 15. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. This is the, the conflict that I see. Uh, I get you sometimes. Maybe in life, you're at this place. But the reality is we have the mind of Christ. Paul, I believe this is Paul struggling through the law. Struggling through living for Jesus, trying to stay out from under the law. Because under the law, this is what happens, man. You start to do things that you can't do. 
that you shouldn't do, that you wish you didn't do. Verse 16. If then I do what I not will to do, excuse me, if then I do what I will not to do, sorry for all the wills and the wants, I agree with the law that it's good. Verse 17. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 18. For I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Verse 19. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. You see this business in Paul. Verse 20. Now if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. It's just sin in me. Verse 21. I find then that a law is present. The one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Verse 23, we're fixing to land this plane. But I see another law warring in my members. It's warring against the law of my mind. It's bringing me in captivity, the law of sin. Verse 24, O wretched man. Here's what Paul cries out. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Have you ever been here? I believe with all my heart, man, God's called me to live free from sin. But the reality of it is there's still some things in my life that ain't quite right. Some people would say, well, that's evidence that you have a sin nature. I disagree. I think it's evidence that I hadn't let Jesus fully in every arena of my life, in my thinking. And so I went on this journey. A couple of days, man, I got out of town. I started seeking Jesus. And immediately when I got out of town, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, the reason why you're struggling with sin is because you're not abiding in me. It has nothing to do with something internal. It has everything to do with external because what's happening is when you don't abide with me, you're getting around your kids and you're trying to love them, but your love runs out eventually and you get angry. You're, you know you're supposed to love your wife. You know you're supposed to do these things and be this way. But what happens is you're trying to do it in your arm of your flesh. You're trying to do it on your own. You're not spending time with me. You're not spending time in the Word and you're not, you're not just abiding in me and therefore you're trying to go out and do what only you can do through the Holy Spirit. And so in this, I believe Paul in this, I, I've been to this place, oh, wretched the end that I am. I can't, no. Uh, who will deliver me from this body of death? Amazing question. Verse 25. I thank God. I'm the, I thank God that he delivered me from sin. He's taught me how to live the sanctified life. And there's a progression in my life of him teaching me to be holy and set apart. And so Paul says, so in my mind, I serve the law of the God, but with flesh the law of sin. And we see this chapter close. And in this process, man, I, I've been here time and time again. Kevin, I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Because I think a lot of times in our life we get here and we just throw our hands up and say, you know what, it is what it is. I'm not going to be able to conquer this until I see Jesus, until Jesus comes back. I disagree. I, because there's tons of texts in 1 John, there's tons of texts in the Bible that would say different to that. And even in Galatians 5. How do we get out of that place of, oh, wretched man that I am, I'm not, I want to live right, I, I want to walk and be, share the gospel with my, my co-workers. I want my kids to know that I love them like Jesus. I want to look like Jesus at home. I want to look like Jesus is a boss. We're, 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 what's the, I know I'm saved, but I'm still seeing this sin thing in my life. Well, this is what I've learned. And I'm learning this the hard way, but this is, I've seen productive fruit in my life over since I gave my life to Jesus with this passage of Scripture in Galatians 5, which ties in. This is what Paul said to the church at Galatia. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. And when you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. I don't think that's simple nature. I think my body still remembers the things it used to do. When I got saved, I was a mad, angry guy. I had to learn how to discipline that. It was a mindset. I had to have the mind of Christ. I had to take the Word of God and put it in my body and refine my thinking. He says, if you'll walk in the Spirit, He's given you the power of God. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff we just talked about. You can be totally free from it. Verse 17. For there's this flesh-spirit conflict we talked about earlier. Oh, here it is again. Imagine that. And the spirit lusts against the flesh. There's this flesh-spirit conflict. And these are contrary to one another, so you don't do the things you wish. Verse 18. But if you're led by the spirit, what's it say? You're not under the law. Sometimes we want to go back under that because it was safe. Don't murder. Okay, I don't murder. Don't steal. Okay, I don't steal. But what about all that? Don't covet. What about all that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Don't have no other gods before you. The law seemed to be safe, but what it does is it produces sin in your life when you go back under it because you can't perform it. You never could. But what he's saying in Galatians 5 is you have an opportunity to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the fruits of this flesh... Let's just go to the next verse. We'll cruise for a minute, Kevin. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Here's some works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, and cleanliness, lewdlessness. Just keep cruising. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies... Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, verse 21, murders, drunkenness, revelries, which I tell you beforehand, as I told you in times past, 
if you practice these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22. But this is how I used to. These are the things that were prevalent. But what? The fruit of the Spirit is absolutely in contradiction to what I just read. It's love. If you love somebody, anger moves. It's joy. Joy dissipates this jealousy. You're happy with what you got. Peace. You have peace with God. Romans 5. Long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. There it is. And watch what he says. Against there is no law. I believe with all my heart in Romans 7, you've got a choice to make. You're going to walk in grace and truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, or you're going to walk back under the law. And it, don't look, it looks different from us because it's do's and don'ts. Sometimes in our life, we don't see it as a law as much as the Jewish culture did. But the reality of it is you're trying to live your Christian life and do what the Bible says do. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you're going back under the law because you're actually trying to do it in your own strength. And watch what he says in verse 5, 24. And those who are Christ have what? Have crucified their flesh, have crucified their willpower to do it in their own strength. And it's passions and desires. Man, I got passions that come up and desires that come up sometime. But guess what? I don't do them. I, I take captive every idle thought and I don't do it. There was a time in my life where I wanted to just jump in my boat and go back fishing. Guess what? I'm still here. It's not my nature anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things are gone. All things are made new. But the enemy comes at me with a temptation to get me to try to step off in sin and go back and go back under what was bringing death in my life. And so verse 25 says this, If we live in the Spirit, here's a promise. It's conditional though. If we live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, verse 26 says, let us not become conceited. If we live in the Spirit, you'll produce the Spirit. But if you continue to choose this flesh and get back on the law, you'll produce death. You, you can't do it. You just can't make it happen. And so I want to close with that today. Are you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? When you read Romans 7, can you connect with Paul? Are you still trying to remarry and be entangled again like Galatians 5 said with the yoke of bondage? Are you really seeing the fruit of the Spirit? Because I'm at this point in my life where I want to see Galatians 5.22 manifest in my own life everywhere I go. I want the people around me to see the love of God. And if they see the love of God, it's going to look like patience. It's going to look like kindness. It's going to look like goodness. It's going to look like self-control. It's going to look like gentleness. And by the way, uh, just a couple of months ago, I'd say to people, man, I ain't never been gentle. That was a lie. Because the Bible says that I am gentle in Christ. And so what I'm learning is I'm learning to put on and wear what Jesus has given me and own it. Because I am gentle now. I am learning fruits of righteousness. How about you? What do you need to do today to get it right so you'll abide in Christ? Ask the Holy Spirit if you're under the law, if you're going back under the letter of the law and not walking in grace. And remember this, grace is not a license to sin. No, it's the freedom to choose to live in Christ. It's the gracious love of God and mercy of God that you can walk this thing out by faith and see culture shift in front of you when you start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and get out from under the law. So guys, bless you. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, that His face shine on you. And I pray as you read Romans 7, hey, study to show yourself approved. Chew on the meat, spit out the bones. If it could be sin nature, not nature, whatever it is, die to it and live for Jesus. Love you guys. Have a good day.